I'm Sam, I'm a drug addict. I got sober at 18 years old. I just always felt off, man. There was always something wrong. There was always something that, that wasn't right inside of me and I didn't know what it was. I couldn't figure out what it was. So I wanted to be cool. You know, I, start, I stopped hanging out with my, with my friends in junior high and I started hanging out with my sister. My older sister was three years older than me and her friends drank. And so I, I went to this place called the Arizona Grand Resort and, uh, and I got drunk for the first time. I ate ecstasy for the first time. I knew at that point that like I could not do ecstasy forever. I had heard what happened to people that did ecstasy all the time. I wasn't okay with, with, with putting my body through, through that kind of pain. I didn't want to become addicted to it because I didn't want to be a drug addict. I always felt alone, I always felt not right, and I always needed something else to make me feel better. And once I smoked weed for the very first time, I knew that, uh, that I had found the solution. No longer than three months later, I got caught at the mall with a, with a bag of weed in my pocket with one of my buddies. It was the only time that I ever got caught by the law. I got put on probation, I was getting drug tested regularly, so I started smoking spice. I went to a concert, my sister and her friends were smoking weed. I was on my very last drug test that I had to take before I went to that concert, and, uh, and I decided it'd be okay to smoke weed. You know, that's, that's the insanity of, of the way that I think. I was 13 at the time, I couldn't buy spice myself. She knew older people, so, so she could get me spice, and uh, so I went to her for it. She said no, I started crying. She said, you're a drug addict. I said, I'm not a drug addict, and I went upstairs to my room and I cried. She came upstairs to my room a couple hours later and said, hey, come into the garage, I wanna show you something. So we go downstairs into the garage. She pulls me over to my dad's workbench. There's this tile on the workbench and it's got a debit card sitting right next to it. And I was like, all right, cool. Uh, debit card, money, like, let's do this. You know what I mean? Like, let's go get high. She was like, no, it's not what it's for. She picked it up. She scraped on the tile a little bit and there was just this bluish white powder. I had no idea what it was. For all I know, it could have been a powdered bleach. And she lined it up. I said, I'm not gonna do that. She said, I'm gonna do this half. You're gonna do this half. And I said, all right, cool, let's do it. So I did my first line of Oxycontin 80 that day, 13 years old. I went upstairs to my room and I nodded off. I was drooling all over myself. And, uh, and I came to, and there was a couple thoughts that ran through my mind. And what that looked like was like, this is incredible. Um, and I'm probably gonna do this for the rest of my life. Um, and then it was like, I love this way too much and, and I'm, I, I can never do this normally. It's not something that I'm gonna be able to do. You know, this, this is going to kill me, you know? And it was at that moment that I knew that like there was definitely a problem. I told myself that I was never gonna do that ever again. I was never gonna do drugs ever again. I was just gonna smoke weed. I found myself downstairs with that tile, scraping the tile off the tile, trying to get high, man. It became an everyday thing. I started going downstairs and stealing my dad's pills, Oxy 80s, Oxy 30s. And one day I came across uh, $1,000 cash. I stole $400 out of that and I went and bought a bunch of beer and a lot of weed. My plan was to sell that weed and just, just put the money back. My dad found out. Um, he went downstairs to go grab that money to go grocery shopping. And it was done, man. He came upstairs and he, he ripped me a new one, man. It was, uh, it was never like a physical thing. It was always just like a verbal type thing, man. It was always just, what the fuck are you doing, dude? You know, what are you doing with your life? Why are you doing this? Why are you lying to me? Do not lie to me. He kept asking me where the money is and I said, I don't know where the money is. I don't have it, you know? And that was the truth to an extent, right? I did not have the money anymore. It was absolutely gone and there was nothing that I could do to get it back. And that was like the first time that, that I really felt the shame, guilt, and remorse of what I had done, you know, of what I had gotten myself into. I was lying, cheating, stealing, manipulating, doing whatever it took to get high. I was stealing from stores. I was stealing from family, mostly family, man. I, I would always go into my dad's room and steal cash from him. I would always steal all of his quarters and take them and cash them in just so I could get high. And then it became a thing where um, me and my dad would get high together. He would need me to get pills for him, and so I would get pills for him. And it just turned into a thing where like we, we would just get high together. It made it a lot easier that way. I didn't have to lie, cheat, steal, or manipulate him, you know? We're going to pick up these pills and we get there and dude's like, dude goes in with the money, comes out, didn't have the money anymore, but he had something and uh, that something happened to be heroin. I tried heroin for the very first time that day at 14 years old, sitting in the back seat of my sister's PT cruiser. I remember looking at it and I remember hearing about heroin and how it was gonna kill me and, uh, and I just didn't wanna do it. It scared the shit out of me, man. I smoked it for the first time, I took one hit of it and I told myself I was not gonna do it. Um, and I hopped out of the car. I fucking threw up everywhere, man. Um, got right back in the car. The same thoughts popped in my head and what that looked like was, I can never do this again. And that, and that wasn't the case. I, I jumped right back in the car. My, the very first thing that I said was, can I have another hit? You know what I mean? Give me another hit. 
Pills got too expensive. Heroin was cheaper. I started doing heroin every day. Heroin turned into meth very shortly after that. I had burned every relationship with my, with my father. Um, me and my sister were fighting on a daily basis. My little sister had was absolutely done with me. My mom knew that I was lying, cheating, and stealing, and getting high. My grandparents knew that, that it was game over. I never had to rob anybody at gunpoint to get high. And the only time I was arrested um, was when I was 13 and I caught a possession charge, you know, and I wasn't even put in handcuffs. I was a 13-year-old kid with skater hair, you know. It was not that intimidating. I had hit the lowest point of my life when I, when I woke up and, and I realized that, like, this is how I'm living my life. Um, I, was, I was upstairs in my room and I was listening to this song and I literally just, it was on full blast and you could hear it throughout the entire house. And, uh, and I'm just entirely breaking down. Um, my mom comes upstairs and she, she starts crying with me and she said, let's get you help. And I said, I'm gonna be okay. Um, and I got high for another six months um, and continue to burn those bridges, man. I dropped out of high school at this time, lived with my sister. We had moved uh, two meth addicts in with us, um, thinking it'd be a great idea. And uh, we would just get high all day. Got into a fight with my sister, cops got called. We got evicted, it was not the very first time the cops got called there. Um, the cops were there probably every night for a solid two months. I moved into my dad's house, which is super convenient because at that point me and him were getting high together anyways. My little sister walked in the room uh, when me and my dad were getting high together. Looks me in the eyes, puts her head down and walks out. And she walks into a room, she slits her wrist, you know? Um, and that was one of those moments where I, 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 I I knew that my actions weren't just hurting me. I walked into my sister's room shortly after that and I, and I laid down next with her and she said, get the fuck out, what are you doing? At 13 years old, you know, get the fuck out, what do you think you're doing? The look of disgust and pain and anguish in her eyes was enough to, to drive me to go and get high again. Before I checked into rehab, um, me and my dad had pawned three TVs, a laptop, a PlayStation, iPad, about two grand worth of gold. We had, I think we had like almost three grand worth of shit in the pawn shop. And uh, it was the only thing I knew how to do. I knew how to pawn shit, I knew how to sell shit, I knew how to steal shit um, to get my shit, to get my high, to get my fix. I have this hole inside of me, man, this spiritual malady that like the only thing that can overcome that is something bigger than me. And the, that's the only thing that I knew would overcome that was, was drugs and alcohol. I had put together like 60 days off of heroin. Um, I wasn't doing heroin. I was I was smoking meth. I was I was doing everything else. And like I thought that heroin was a problem. And like I thought that everything was okay. Everything looked okay on the outside. But again, I was still depressed and, and struggling on the inside. I Man, I was suffering. I'm sitting in my dad's room. We're we're about to get high. And he says uh, he says hey he says I think that one of us should go to rehab. And he says either I'm gonna go to rehab. I'm gonna lose my job. We're gonna lose the house. We're gonna be homeless. I mean, you're 18 years old. You haven't worked a day in your life. It was five months after my 18th birthday. So he took me to this place in Scottsdale and, uh, and I went in, did the whole intake. I was super pissed that they wouldn't let me go smoke a cigarette. Um, and I was already not feeling the place. So I called my mom and I said, hey mom, I said, I don't think this is the place for me. And she said, okay, that's okay. Just stay, honey, it's gonna be okay. And she cried and she pleaded with me and I called my dad and I said, hey pop, I said, this isn't the place for me. And he said, all right, cool, I'm on my way. So my dad came and picked me up and I got high. And he said, that's not what we're doing. You're gonna go to rehab. And I was like, okay, cool. I remember nothing about the intake. Um, I ate eight Valium. I smoked about a gram and a half of dope before I went in. Um, smoked a little bit of meth, smoked a bunch of weed. And uh, it was like day seven, you know, when I was actually able to remember anything. And uh, on day 10, I had, I had the worst mental obsession that I've ever had. My counselor came and sat down and talked to me and he said, Sam, he said, uh, I said, I said, listen, dude, I said, I'm, I'm going to get high. Um, drugs and alcohol is always going to be there. What am I going to do? I'm going to get high. And he said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I said, okay, cool. That's reassuring, you know? And he said, Sam, he said, as long as you're willing to admit um, that you are absolutely fucked and that you're going to get high again, um, then you're, I think you're going to be all right, dude. You know, he said, that's, that's the first step, you know? And I said, I was like, all right, cool, whatever, dude. Whatever, like that doesn't help me, you know? And he said, Sam, he said, can I tell you a story? And I said, yeah. He says, do you know what the Romans did before they went to battle? And I said, no, I do not. Um, and I really don't care about your history lesson. So before the Romans went to battle, they would go and they would dock their boats on a beach or wherever they were going to take over. Their ruler would tell them all to get off the ships, that they would have to burn their ships. And that gives them two options, right? And what that looks like is go out and fight to the death, come out victorious and start a new life or go out and fight and try to return back to the ships and, and die, 
you know, return back to old ways or start a new life, you know. And uh, and I and I I subconsciously chose to start a new life, man. I just thought that like, how could God let all this bad shit happen to me and my family? Um, how could there be a God? And uh, but I went upstairs to my room that night. I didn't know I didn't know what else to do, so I hit my knees and I prayed and I said, "Please fucking help me, because I can't do this on my own." It was my very first honest prayer that I've ever said. And uh, that night I fell asleep with a baby. Right before I woke up, I had this dream, this experience, I like to call it. I saw the most beautiful place that I've ever seen in my entire life, the most extravagant colors. And I heard, you're in the right place, you're doing the right thing. And I woke up with a smile on my face and goosebumps all over my body. And I didn't want to get high anymore. I didn't want to make my mom cry anymore. I didn't ever want to have to look into my little sister's eyes or anybody in my family for that matter and, and see the pain and anguish of, of watching me kill myself slowly through drugs and alcohol, man. Um, and everything changed, you know? I, I got a guy that, that had found a solution. Um, and I started running through the steps, man. Step one, I'm fucked. Step two, um, I had to believe in something. And at that, I, I had to come to believe that something was going to restore me to sanity. Um, and I believed that, man. I knew that um, something had to change and I knew that something had changed inside of me, man. I, I had had a very vital spiritual experience. Step three, I was willing to turn my life over to something and I, and I, and I still attempt to do that every single day, man. I wrote a four-step. Um, I looked at resentments. I looked at fears, man. All these things that, that made me who I was, you know. All these resentments, all these, all these, all these things that I held on for, to for so long. Super accurate fears, like the fears of being alone, fears of not being good enough, you know, and entirely irrational fears, you know, fear of heights, fear of spiders, right? You know, I, I got to write a, a list of all the people that I'd harmed in my life, you know. I got to go back to all of those people and, and make amends and, and let them know that I was wrong, you know. I got to look at my character defects on step six and seven and really look at who I am as a person, all of my flaws, all of my defects. I get to continue to build, build my life on a spiritual level. You know, I get to live my life on an altruistic plane, trying to help people on a daily basis, trying to stay connected to some type of higher power, man. That's the only thing that keeps me close. You know, it's the only thing that keeps me connected is sitting, sitting across the table from another alcoholic and sharing my experience, man, sharing what has brought me to this point today. 12-step fellowship, man, you know, that's what I've found. Um, that's the only thing that has been able to help me, man. I went into sober living shortly after that, moved into my own apartment with a couple guys that I met in sober living. One of those guys is loaded and the other one just died, heroin overdose. I've been to about 15 funerals in the last two and a half years from overdoses. I get to go to my sponsor's wedding now, so that's pretty rad. You know, they, they, they told me when I, when I first came into this thing that I was gonna have to buy a black suit, you know? I'm gonna go to a lot of, a lot of funerals um, but hopefully even more weddings, you know? And I didn't believe them, you know? I didn't believe my, I, I, was, I was very hopeful that all of us would be successful. And I was like 30 days sober, um, sitting across the table from my mom at Wendy's, and she's like dishing all her stuff out on me, all the stuff that I really, like, I, I don't wanna hear, you know? She says, Sam, what do I do? You know, and I said, Mom, I said, I'm 30 days sober, like, I don't know what you want to tell you. Go to a meeting, get a sponsor, and start working some steps and see what happens. My mom's been sober ever since. She has, uh, she has almost two and a half years sober as well. My older sister watched everything that I did from a distance. She was living in Florida. After we got evicted, she moved out to Florida and hit her bottom out there. And uh, she got sober about 10 months after I did. I mean, my boss is in recovery. My, my other coworker is in recovery, man. And so like all of my friends are, are in recovery. All of my friends are, are sober drug, addict, drug, addicts, drug addicts and alcoholics. Most of my family is in recovery. It's wild, man. You know, I never thought that, that the solution would be as simple as it is, man. This thing is not easy, but this is a simple solution. There is something wrong spiritually inside of me, and I don't know what that problem is. I never feel right about myself. I never know what to do next. I never know what action to take. All I wanna do is, uh, is help people and, and live a good life, a good, happy life. And I know that the only way that I can do that is continued on this road to recovery, you know, that, that, was, that was so freely given to me. What I know, man, is, is if, the, if you're out there and you're struggling, and you don't believe that this thing is possible, you don't believe that, that recovery is gonna work for you, or you don't think that you can recover, or you think that you're too bad, or you're not as bad um, as somebody else, you know? You can recover if you're willing to recover. If you're ready to recover, if you are willing to recover, um, then you will recover. It's as simple as that. You know, there is a solution, man. Um, there is a solution. All you have to do is take a few simple steps to get to the place that you wanna go to achieve every single one of your goals in your life. I never thought that was gonna be possible for a kid like me. I'm 20 years old, man, and I, I have almost two and a half years sober. Um, it's just not something that I've seen very much, you know? 
if you're, if you're out there and you're struggling, find a solution, man. Find a meeting to go to. Find a good group of people to hang out with. Take this simple solution and run with it because it will give you a life greater than you could have ever imagined. Simple as that.